everybody. Now. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is uh, Sean Petrasky here with my uh, good friend, uh, John Lamazny. I am John Lamazny. And you are here for the eighth episode of The Customer and the Service. The Customer and the Service. How are you doing tonight, John? I'm doing well, Sean. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I'm pretty excited about tonight's episode because uh, one of our big topics tonight is actually uh, inspired by a piece of mail that uh, we received from uh, one of our viewers. So I think this is a, a sign that people are checking us out, listening to what we have to say, and it's a uh, you know a good a good thing to have feedback from your audience. It's fantastic to get feedback. I'm really excited that um, somebody was so interested in what we had to say that they wanted to clarify on um, what they wanted to hear us talk about. We, we always love about to uh, talk about things that people want to hear different perspectives on. So to bring the audience up to speed, uh, in our second episode, I mentioned... Uh, a conversation that I had with a colleague of mine named uh, Matt Parker and uh, Matt and I uh, were speaking uh, about some things that you and I were talking about John about uh, the quality of IT service uh, that many IT providers service providers give their customers and how you know a lot of people are frustrated with uh, not receiving good service and things like that so Matt had made a comment to me privately uh, and I shared that comment with with you on our second episode, and we took it. We took that conversation uh, into a full blown topic for our show. Uh, Matt Matt listened to that episode a little bit uh, a few weeks after that episode aired, uh, and he wrote us the following message, which I'll uh, share with the audience. Very good. It was interesting to see where you guys took the comment I made before. I had been on a different tangent, which I didn't communicate well. My tangent was more about how there are lots of service provider slash customer relationships. The ones you guys have been focusing on most is the type of service provider slash customer relationship where the customer is paying for something they could easily do themselves if necessity dictated, making sandwiches, burritos, buying groceries, etc. What I find interesting is the service provider customer relationship where the customer cannot, cannot feasibly do the task themselves. For example, doctor, patient, mechanics, uh, other IT technicians, librarians, teacher, student, etc. What I've been, what I've seen in my own job amongst other technicians is that there are some people who treat an IT technician the same way they treat a sandwich preparation person, such as at Subway, basically thinking that they know more about the, the uh, subject than a technician does. I've seen IT people contribute to this mentality unintentionally, of course, by accepting the attitude that they are. A sandwich, um, yeah, that they're a sandwich prep person. Basically, they do not know what's best the customer does. I find this fascinating because I think it comes into play profoundly with your customer satisfaction level. It's counterintuitive, counterintuitive that, com uh, that commanding a level of respect actually provides greater customer service. If you let them think that you are as the sandwich prep person, then you've pigeonholed yourself into being less valuable. I know when I encounter a user who thinks this way, I will usually work an analogy into the conversation to change their perspective. I'll make references to mechanics or doctors and how the patient or client in those situations could argue with the diagnosis, but that doesn't make it less true. Obviously, this has to be sub subtle, but in connecting my services to doctors and mechanics in the user's mind, rather than the sandwich prep people, I find I'm much more respected and fewer disagreements arise about what the best course of action is. I'm probably also more likely to be consulted on more complicated issues. Obviously, some users are just uh, obstinate and view e even surgeons as sandwich prep people. So I think that was a really uh, great letter. Um, I'm glad Matt explained where, where he was really going with that original comment that we discussed. Uh, and uh, in preparing for tonight's show, I, you and I, John, uh, spoke about this. And we realized that there's a whole other issue here uh, that we wanted to talk about. And it's... You know, to boil it down briefly, for those of you uh, that found that uh, message a little long-winded, is that there are there are customer service relationships where the client feels that they know more than the service provider. 
um, you and I believe you, um, John, coined the phrase the tech the technologist as surgeon versus the technologist as sandwich guy belief. Um, and I think this is definitely uh, a, something that you and I and many people in our field face almost probably on a daily basis, whether we realize it or not. Uh, we we deal with clients who probably feel this way about us. Um, and I think it's an interesting challenge that we have to overcome uh, because, you know, I know that there are times when I, like, you know, like Matt talked about, the analogies he uses with a mechanic, uh, you know, or even a doctor, that there are people that second guess those people all the time. And, uh, you know, IT is not as, not, can, I guess, not as important as, well, no, it is important, but I think what I'm trying to say is it's not as, uh, I guess I want to say life-threatening as maybe a doctor's visit or a visit to your mechanic. Well, I, I think it depends. I mean, it, for some people, technology is is uh, sort of like life and death. You know, it's if you need technology, for example, to get your work done, it, it may certainly affect your life to not be able to use technology. But what what interested me about the idea that uh, Matt brought up was um, sort of considering a, a, a series of continua about service and um, customership. And it's it, one of the things that I got in my master's degree uh, which is about organizational leadership was a great deal of theories that deal with dual axes where along one axis is one along one axis is one um, consideration and along another axis is another consideration and the way that you plot points in regards to those two possibilities gives you different outcomes and um, what the letter sparked for me was that we ought to think a little bit about customer service from both the service side and the customer side in, in um, such a way as to consider you know, whether or not it's a good thing for a service provider to be knowledgeable about what it is that they're doing and whether or not it's a good thing for a customer to know something about the service that's being provided. If, for example, you know, if we use some of the analogies that we have talked about already, or examples that we've talked about already, like the surgeon, if you are going under the knife with a surgeon who's a skilled surgeon, who's a cancer surgeon, and you just have been diagnosed with cancer and know nothing about it aside from the fact that it's very possible you're going to die, your lack of knowledge about cancer may influence the success of the surgeon because there are many studies for example that say that your uh, outlook about surviving cancer has a lot to do with whether or not you will and um, you know th that's an extreme example but uh, if I sit down to resolve a technology issue as a technologist if I sit down to, to uh, resolve a technology issue with somebody who knows something about the issue, we always, always have a better outcome, typically, um, as long as they are open to listen to ideas and are coming to me in good faith that I can help them and not coming to me. I have been with customers where um, the person knows a lot of problems about the issue and they come to me and say, how can we resolve this? What are some outcomes? And I'll start to work out solutions and I'll say, oh, but the real problem with that is that um, I don't really want to deal with X or I don't really want to deal with Y or I've already thought about that and um, I, I, I've, essentially what I find out is that they have worked out all the issues. They know enough about the problem to have worked out all the issues and really just wanted to sort of have fun with me. <laughs> And uh, which is not fun for me at all, but rather, you know, it was just an opportunity maybe for them to get some personal joy out of embarrassing me that I didn't come up with a solution better than the one that they had. 
that only happened a few times. There's, there's a few people who I can think of where uh, that happened again and again. I thought it was just a personal, almost like a um, like a mental issue that they had. They were they were so brilliant in terms of technology, and yet they still called on me almost to sort of browbeat me. It, it was weird. But um, that, that doesn't happen very often. More often, I will sit down with another technologist to resolve an issue, and because we both have some experience with the issue, and because the issue is not well known, we're able to resolve it really well. I can think of colleagues who I work with on a regular basis where when I walk away from a situation that we've solved, I feel like I became better, they became better, the problem was resolved, we have an answer for other people who might encounter the problem sometime in the future. And it's a beautiful, beautiful instance of customer service both ways and more of a peer level customer service. It, it's sometimes difficult to uh, walk into somebody's office where they feel like they already have a solution in mind but they don't at all and they didn't expect that there might be money aspects or whatever. And uh, that often can be painful. You have to have an open mind. So anyway, in um, hearing Matt's letter about the issue, I decided to draw up one of these graphs that considers two considerations. Let me show it to you. So on the screen here, uh, you can see that we have two uh, axes. We have an expertise of server or service and the expertise of the customer or the recipient of the service. And here we have this grid that sort of exemplifies four situations that you might run into depending on whether it's a low expertise of server with a low expertise of customer or a high expertise of server with a high expertise of customer. So um, I think about this situation where you have the service knowing quite a bit about, let's say, some particular research topic and the person who's coming in knowing quite a bit about the research topic and the, the fantastic potential of something like this, such as a scholar sitting with a reference librarian to talk about um, new resources for research. On the other end, you have um, lower expertise of servers, such as somebody who is managing an estate sale, and a lower expertise of customer who is just there to um, make a purchase of something but don't really know what they want or, or whatever this is likely to have a bad outcome <laughs> because nobody really has much of an investment in a great outcome. Uh, they, it, it's sort of the blind leading the blind and in both directions. Here uh, we have a low expertise of server versus a high expertise of customer such as a technologist like Sean or I walking into a retail electronics counter where um, we are often forced to do this because uh, we want to put our hands on an object that only happens to be present at, let's say, a Best Buy, and we have to go through all of the typical rungs of a ladder to get some particular product because that's where it is. And we have to deal with this person because of the clumsy way that the interface is set up. If I can just get at the object, then everything's fine, but if I have to deal through somebody who doesn't necessarily have as much knowledge as I do about the object after I've done a bunch of research and, and meanwhile they're just trying to keep their six dollar an hour job this is likely to be a frustrating outcome for the customer and um, I actually mentioned before this idea of a newly diagnosed patient who doesn't know much about let's say cancer at a specialist office where uh, this has great potential for good outcomes but it would be even better if the newly diagnosed patient learned something about cancer and had a higher expertise about the cancer or whatever it might be so that they can uh, have a better outcome. So generally speaking, we want to be on this, you know, three blocks or at least up here somewhere. It, it's important to have a high expertise of service. It's less important to have a high expertise of customer, but um, good things can happen when there is both a good expertise of customer and a good expertise of service. That's a really wonderful chart. And, you know, I looked at it earlier tonight when you showed it to me and 
you know, uh, at a surface glance, I, I understood where you were going, but after listening to that that deeper explanation, it's 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 absolutely brilliant, and in a lot of ways, and I feel like you know we should that that could be in like. If there was a textbook on customer service, like that would be like figure two two dot fourteen or something. This is your textbook on customer service. This is it? You know, I think it's those scenarios that you talked about. I mean, being that technologist, I want to f focus on the the one where the the customer has more knowledge than the service provider. That's that's my favorite. I think it really is. It's I, I it's something I, I love. I actually really love being in that situation. And there are times some sometimes I'll go. There you go. Here's a really terrible confession that I'm about to make. So uh, sometimes I will Which go. Gonna be, it's going to be our next show. Terrible confessions. Technology <laughs> and terrible confessions. Sometimes I go into the cell phone section of Best Buy. I've done this for years. Not, I don't need a cell phone. Don't need one. And I'll, I'll pretend that I'm looking at phones. And I'll kind of gravitate to where I see there's a salesperson working with another person. And I, I always listen to what's going on. So like my most recent cause, you know, I'm a big fan of the Windows phone platform. So anytime uh, I have an opportunity to go to the mobile phone department and float around. Uh, there's been a, uh, more times than I I, I, I would ever expect, actually, where I've actually heard customers say, so what's the deal with this Windows phone? You know, they've listened to the spiel about the iPhone, Android. You know, maybe they've asked a question about BlackBerry. And the salesman almost always never mentioned Windows phone. And I've been in the presence of a few customers who... I've actually brought it up themselves. Like, oh, I see that this phone is fifty dollars. It runs Windows. What's the story there? And this is this is what I live for. And the the misinformation that's always given uh, about the you know not just Windows Phone but other platforms. Uh, you know, in the past it used to be Palm. Uh, mm -hmm. I've even heard pieces of misinformation about Android being given. Oh yeah. And I just I love to hear it, and then I laugh to myself. And then what I always do is I speak up and correct the sales clerk in front of the customer. And <laughs> I know that's probably like really, really horrible, but I take a great amount horrible. of joy in it. Kind of horrible. I mean, imagine if, if somebody <laughs> could do that in your work. If somebody could hang out at your office and just wait for you to like mis misstate something or say something as we all do. Uh, to in order to nudge somebody in a certain direction because we understand that it's probably better for them than trying to convince them to you know what I mean it, it, there's sometimes I suggest an iPad to somebody despite the benefits that I feel for an Android because an iPad is better for that person well I'm not I'm not even talking about that no no let's not let's hold on a second let's not let's not interpret what I just this confession as me being uh, a fanboy wanting to get everyone over to my side. What I'm saying is, like, I really only speak up when there's blatant lies. Like, for example, like, the, one of the things I heard was, uh, you know, the, 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 the person quest, the question was, uh, does this Windows phone have Bluetooth? And the salesperson saying, no, no, no Windows phones have Bluetooth capability. They only have red tooth. Yeah, right. So and there you go. I mean, that's an example of me then saying, uh, actually, I have a Windows phone. I know a lot about them. That's not true. Every Windows phone has, has Bluetooth. And then the salesperson almost always is like, oh, well, I didn't think that was true. And then the customer will always be like, thank you. I really appreciate you uh, sharing that with us. And then I'll just leave. I'll drop my one little piece of knowledge, and I'll leave. And that's it. I'm done. It's so. <laughs> so funny that you say this because I I have actually done what 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 came to mind when you said this was supplemental customer service. Yeah. Oh, I do that all the time. Yeah. So I mean, but it takes many many forms. Sometimes it's electronics, and and uh, I was probably I don't know six months ago I was in an electronics store helping somebody pick out a television, and. Um, while we were waiting, there was a there was a guy 
who was trying to find out about some TV or some something and nobody would talk to him and I wasn't quite sure what was going on but it, like this customer was actively being ignored and all he wanted was an answer I, I think what he didn't want was to buy something and they realized this and they were like oh um, this person is not going to be converted to a sale and they came here for help and we're not in, interested in helping them we just want to sell him something and you know this was like a big box it was Best Buy <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and it was sort of an older gentleman and he really needed help and he he kept standing at the counter it was such an awkward moment and uh, he was standing at the wrong counter too he was standing at the Comcast sales counter you know how they have a guy who yeah. like just sets up and right. the guy was like I can't help you I can't he was being so rude and uh, so I took the guy aside and I said, "What what is it you're looking for?" And he, what like I said, he was asking questions about a 3D TV or something. Um, and I answered his question. And he was like, "Thank you very much, sir." And I was like, "You're welcome, sir. I hope you have a good day." And he walked off. But it's like I I like to help people, you know. Even though the the people in place should not have given me an opportunity to, because you never know what that customer service is going to turn into. Right. What positive thing is going to be an outcome? You know. I do the same thing in the video game aisle a lot, where I'll often see, uh, you know, like so a mother. Targeted though, you're so targeted. You only do it in like the phone section and the video game section. But I actually am. I don't do what I do in the phone section in the video game. Like I often will find that. You know, there's a grandmother or a mother who's trying to buy a video game for their son or a relative, and you can tell that they're looking for something and they can't find it, or they need help picking something, or they'll be talking to somebody that they're with them, and I'll like eavesdrop to hear, and I'll just chime in and say, "Oh, this is what you're looking for," or the one in your left hand is really great for twelve-year-olds. You know, like just that type of thing. I do that all the they, time. What do they sound like when they say thank you, Sean? They say. Thank you very much. Like you know, they just they they're very appreciative. But I want to I want to kind of just I want the not the video game example so much, but the mobile phone example. I want I want to kind of justify why why I do this, and this pulls it back into not to, to me, not to me, maybe to the viewer. But yeah, I, exactly I know exactly what you're doing. And this is going to pull it back into to the topic here, and that's when I worked in in customer service as a, a retail clerk for four years in, in the video game industry I made it my business to be well informed of almost all the products that I sold and if I got caught in a situation where I didn't have an answer I brought in a coworker who did or I would find a way to get a correct answer well think about the work that you do every day right it's the same somebody, thing somebody I, comes to you and they're, they're like you know uh, I'm trying to do this thing with blackboard and I don't know exactly how to do it and uh, I certainly know it because it's it's directly related to everything that I do but right. you have to know it at least peripherally right you can't say I don't know anything about blackboard I don't know this but the thing that, and this is what I want to say is like the, the thing that bothers me is people in service roles who instead of saying, hey, I don't know, let me find an answer, or hey, let me get someone who knows the answer, they lie. Like I said, oh, yeah, Windows phones don't have Bluetooth. And that's what, and that's what bothers me, is that people don't take the time to get answers for customers. Because I, I tell you this, if you educate a customer about something that you yourself don't know, and you bring in someone who does, or you take the time to find the answer for them, that that customer is going to appreciate that, you know what I mean? It's so funny that you say this. I I just was I I noticed it on a thread yesterday on Facebook. Somebody who is in the technology service uh, realm talked about this idea of um, being trained in the idea that if you don't know something, to say I don't know, and then let's find out. Right. In fact, we both know her, and um. I, I chimed in immediately and said, you know, agree, as, uh, essentially, because that's such an important ability as a service provider to say, 
I don't know right now, but we can go find out right now. I say that daily. I say it every day. Every day. And I was in a training session today where I was talking about using Google Docs for collaboration. And uh, we went through the research tool, which allows you to cite um, articles that you can search on in a sidebar. And by default, if you don't change the setting, which I didn't even know existed, the citation is done in Chicago format. Oh. And uh, I personally don't like Chicago format. Most of the work that I do is in APA. And somebody in the audience said, uh, can you change the format? And I, I said, I don't know. Let's find out. And we did a quick search and found out that, you know, it's a couple clicks in, but you can change it to uh, three different formats, APA, Chicago, and something else. And so I changed the APA for myself. It made it a much more usable, much more likely tool for me. But I had no idea. And I think that in that situation, especially when you're in the front of the room or you're hovering over somebody at their desk, there's sort of a belief or an understanding that the direct opposite of this other thing that Matt was talking about where they know more than you, the, the people sometimes think that you know everything or that you should know everything or that you already know everything. And sometimes letting them know that you don't know but here's how you find out is such an incredible skill to pass on and such a horizontal um, measure to let somebody f understand that you're on a level playing service that, that surface that you're not above them but rather they're equal and the one difference between you is that you spend time on this all the time and this is how you find out new things about this particular product yeah I do it every day too and I think I think if if like you know the salespeople like I'm like I'm mentioning from the mobile department if they took the time to find the answer then that's going to not only benefit the customer, it's going to benefit them in the future. Because the next person that comes in and asks about Windows Phone and Bluetooth, they're going to know right away. Absolutely, it has it. You know what I mean? So I think that when they just lie or come up with an answer that's not true, they're doing not only a disservice to the customer, but they're doing a disservice to them as salespeople. And I just want to say, I don't, I, I doubt very highly that that um, Best Buy is in the practice of telling their their blue shirts to uh, lie to customers in order to sell. I doubt that as well. Absolutely yeah. doubt that. And there are probably very many people who work in, in that position and other positions just like it all over the, the world who know literally uh, everything there is to know about mobile phones. If they spend all day in that mobile phone section, they walk around, they know all those models, they know what the pros and cons are, they know what the, yeah? Yeah, no it, doubt. We're technologists. We're not mobile phone specialists. Why wouldn't they know more than us, potentially? Right. I have had the experience that you've had where it's a teenager or something, and they just uh, – I don't even want to cut on teenagers. It's, it's not about age. It's not about gender. It's not about the job. It's about that individual not doing enough to know as much as they can about the work that they're doing. It's an issue of pride. They don't take pride in the work they do. Right. And that's, I mean, that's what it boils down to. And sadly, I mean, you'd think that given the the economic situation in our country, you know, people with a job would take a great amount of pride in the fact that, hey, listen, I'm working right now and I better, I better damn work, work it out so that I keep this job. You know what I mean? And being up on your product is the most basic form of that, you know? And, and you know, think about a customer who is pushed in a direction that is different than the question that they asked. Like, you know, they end up with an iPhone, and they're perfectly happy with it, but they find out later that Windows does have Bluetooth and that they could have saved, you know, $400 or whatever the case is, but it wasn't in the best interest of the house to sell them a $400 or less phone. And it's the anger that, that grows with that. And the other thing that I wanted to mention was one of the things that I know about generational differences in doing studies of uh, younger generations versus older generations for academia is um, in all these profiles we always hear about Gen Y and, and so on, right. is that there is less um, motivation on the part of younger generations in general, not, I'm not talking about specific people who happen to be 17, 
uh, in general, there is less loyalty to, let's say, a working organization or an organization that they belong to, uh, comparative to our generation and older generations, where there was great loyalty, you know, and, and somebody might have stayed at one place for their entire career simply because it was like a marriage. It was like a, a commitment that you made early on that said, this is where I'm going to spend the 50 years of work that I'm going to do. Right. You know, whereas, um, unfortunately, the people in Best Buy might recognize they might not be around next year, and they might recognize that they're gaining retail experience but not electronics experience, and uh, that uh, they want to be able to take their skills that they've gained and be able to apply them in a lot of different ways, not just one way. They're versatilists rather than uh, specialists. And so it, they may not feel like it's important for them to know everything there is to know about this new Windows phone, and maybe they're highly influenced by their lack of interest in a Windows phone, whereas you and I know the value of knowing systems beyond what we love. Right. And beyond what we care about and beyond what we want to see succeed. I think I think one thing, though, too, that I think uh, sort of, inf I mean, I had this realization a couple years ago. I don't know if you remember that poster that, P that they used to sell in poster stores that said everything I need to learn about life I learned in kindergarten and it, would, learn, it would list everything out. Yeah. Everything I needed to learn about customer service I learned by working at Funko Land. And that, I mean, there isn't a day that doesn't go by where I reflect upon a lesson that I learned about customer service from working there, where I don't reflect upon guidance from one of my managers that worked with me. Uh, you know, there it, it all stems back to Funko Land at some point. You know, it's like six degrees of Kevin Bacon for me. And if you were to if you were to follow me around, you know, and shadow me. And, and watch my customer interactions and or how I do my job, even though I'm doing IT support in an academic environment, which is you couldn't get any further away from selling used video games in a TJ Maxx plaza, uh, it all stems back to that, though. It all does. And I think that if people open their minds and their eyes, they would realize that there is, if they took the service that they provide at Best Buy or wherever they work, Target or Walmart, as seriously as I took Funko Land, they would realize that it would benefit them further down the line. I mean, I learned so much about leadership, how to be a supervisor, you know, so many different skills that come into play in my daily professional life. Learned them all there at that job. You know what I mean? And that's the only job I've had outside of working in IT and higher ed. And it's was a four-year job. I worked in high school and college there. One of the most valuable experiences. And I'm sure if you were to think about the different jobs you had before you got into IT, I'm sure there's many, many valuable lessons that you use daily that have transcended those. I'll, I will never forget the day in Michaels. I, I was working in a Michaels. They were doing a, a reboot of a Michaels in uh, Pennsylvania. And I was doing day work, essentially, and, and I was only supposed to be there for three months, and they ended up making me a manager, trying to make me a manager. As it turned out, I ended up doing landscaping instead because it paid more. But uh, one of the things I'll never forget is uh, a customer coming over to me while I was being trained, uh, and the trainer said, um, how can I help you? The customer said, where are the whatever – pipe cleaners, and instead of saying, oh, uh, aisle six, like they walked them over to the pipe cleaners, made sure that they, it was exactly what they wanted, and um, made sure that everything, every need was met, and then said, are you happy? And she was like, very happy. And then he walked back over to me, and he said, that's how you handle a uh, customer need. And it was it was such a small interaction, but I will never, ever forget it. Because it, it covered so many situations and so many possibilities with um, remember that the customer is here because they want to be they want to leave happy you know and it, it goes goes with me everywhere this little like two minute interaction that we had and that's and amazing that's absolutely amazing 
you've seen the list of jobs that I've had. You saw you saw my uh, paragraph block on my resume. <laughs> yes. Resume. Well, I think you know. I think that these are all these this with this little kind of side tangent we've gone on here about the you know uh, customer knowing more than the salesperson. Uh, you know, I think that it really is a perfect. Um, you know, a great example of the importance of knowledgeable people providing service. You know, you can't just have a warm body on the floor or a warm body in the desk. You know, I mean, I've, I've seen departments at, at various institutes of higher education that, you know, need a technology person and they arbitrarily assign a secretary that IT role because she just happens to be good at Word. You know what I mean? And that doesn't necessarily <laughs> mean that requirement. Yeah, that yeah. they know how to, to troubleshoot, you know, a, a boot up issue or anything. And I think that that's kind of falls under that that belief of, you know, oh well, and, you know, anybody can do IT work. You know, you just need to have some basic, you know, can you turn it on? You know, and then and again. That's a per another example of the the customer potentially knowing more than the sales clerk when you do that, and you know, that's the service provider, not, not not as knowledgeable potentially as a customer, which could definitely frustrate an entire department of of customers. You know. Oh, and how about the situation? This is an interesting one, and one that you may even recognize what I'm talking about, <laughs> where uh, you have somebody who is in a service position and let's say they're a technologist, and they believe in their mind that they know everything there is to know about most technologies, and they're very vocal about their uh, understanding of these things, and uh, lead customers to go off on these wild tangents uh, just because it's, um, it's like a sickness. It is. You well, and I, I think that's... Uh... A perfect example of the blind leading the blind. Oh man! You know, and I think that's also another dangerous scenario. You know, like you said, the the customer at the estate sale, where neither person is informed about what is being sold or what is being bought. But for in the example you've given, the estate seller is faking. Oh yes, this is a, a King James the Fourteenth. Uh, <laughs> A, 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 boot, a boot, boutonniere, you know what I mean, or whatever, and they're just making it up, and because they don't want to appear unknowledgeable, you know, that unknowledgeable. No, they they want to appear legitimate. They right. want to appear, appear completely legitimate, and they want to wear the cap and the whole bit. But it's like for them, it's more fun to wear the cap than to actually know the knowledge that that the cap is supposed to be worn to indicate. Right, it's like the people that when they're stopped and asked for directions, purposely tell the person that like where, where they're not looking to go. Go four blocks down. Yeah. Make a left. No wait. Make a right. No make a left. Yeah. It's bad. It is. So, anything else on this topic? Oh, there's plenty, but I think we should move on. Okay. Well, thank you, Matt Parker. For your email, uh, I hope that you feel. I know we we kind of went off on only one area of the grid there, but I I hope you think that we've uh, discussed and addressed your your issues and questions. Uh, and if not, we'd love to hear hear more from you, and we'll uh, continue this conversation another week. Yeah, and maybe in the future we'll have a recurrence of the uh, customer expertise grid. Uh, and talk a little bit more about some of the other quadrants to see if we can find some better examples than the ones that we, uh, additional examples to the ones that we had. Something tells me that the customer expertise grid will be re reoccurring. And if you, in fact, I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe our first piece of customer in the service merchandise <laughs> would be the customer expertise grid t-shirt. Uh, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Maybe. Let's get on Cafe Press and get that fired up. <laughs> Maybe a napkin. You know, it'll have like a lobster on the back and, a, <laughs> and the expertise grid on the front. I love it. Oh, jeez. Uh, a neckerchief. 
<laughs> or like we could get like a remember like kids would go to punk shows with like jean jackets and they would pin on like sections of black t-shirts. Do you remember that? I used to have a jean jacket with patches on it. Somewhere. That's awesome. Well, it is awesome. The customer expertise grid should be on your jean jacket in 2012. This is true. It could happen. <laughs> All right. So our next topic tonight is one that we've been trying to talk about for a couple of weeks. Uh, and I think that there's been some recent developments in the uh, tech sphere that I think even make this more relevant now than probably any other week we try to talk about it. And that is uh, the emergence now of, uh, of technology companies getting in the business of end-to-end -end service. So a technology provider providing everything a customer soup to nuts so let's give an example so our, 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 reader, our viewers and listeners understand what we're talking about. In the past, when you bought a computer with Microsoft Windows on it or, or, or our Apple uh, OS 9, let's say, you got an operating system. There was no mechanism in place for the customer to easily purchase anything else for that operating system, right? So there was no officially blessed way for a, a customer to, to get add-on software or content for that, that computer easily. You well, had to go to third parties. Like Windows 95 or are we talking like Windows 3.1? No, we're talking even Windows 7 and OS, OS 10.5. Well, if you're talking, when you bought an operating system, uh, when you I'm, bought an operating system, you had to rely upon third parties to get media, um, software, whatever. You had to go to a third party. Well, when did the iTunes? When did the App Store show up on Mac OS X? Uh, a long time ago. But here's the thing. That just one one avenue does not make a, 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 an organization end to end. Okay. So let me clarify. So now in 2012, we have companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, and even Sony, who provide their customers with a slate of devices: computers, portable music, portable media players, tablets, phones, whatever. And not, when a customer buys one of those devices, they are buying into a full ecosystem. And through each one of these devices, customers are able to, to purchase software, music, videos, uh, books, and a plethora of other things all through those devices. So just to clarify, we're talking about uh, competing ecosystems. So we're, talk, we're talking about the emergence of providers not providing just as a device but also an entire marketplace for their customers right so we're, we're talking about Amazon which is why the Kindle exists we're talking about the surface which is Microsoft's entry we're talking about the iPad and the iTunes music store and we're talking about Google and the uh, Play Store for example for examples of devices and media being brought along a single stream. Absolutely. That's exactly what we're talking about. So this is a, this is a this is a relatively new thing that's a, that's emerged over the past I'd say 2 years. We we've had providers who have had individual solutions in place. Apple very early on had the iTunes store, but did not have iBooks, did not have an App Store, etc. Microsoft very similar, Google also in the same boat, and Amazon as well was also at, at, one, at various points the same way. But now they've all kind of had this realization that it's not about providing an individual marketplace. It's about an all-encompassing marketplace. And this is, I think, a really amazing area of, of service for customers and I think there's been a lot of interesting trends in this sphere. Uh, one in particular for me, and, and I hope maybe we can uh, 
tackle this tonight is Amazon was probably Amazon and Apple. It's debatable who was first or, or not. Were probably the two, first two to offer a complete end-to-end -end, uh, ecosphere. You said Apple and whom? Apple and Amazon. Right, and, and I would say that it was Apple, then Amazon, Google very quickly after. Sure. It's like, it's like the dominoes fell very quickly. They when did. the Play Store showed up, right. it was a result of them realizing, and and uh, around the same time, the, the tablet, they recognized that Kindle was so intent, uh, Amazon was so intent on the Kindle being this be-all, one, uh, stream of content that they they made a cheap device, not a che not a cheap device, but they they made a highly affordable device because they were willing to lose money on the device because all they cared about was being able to play their content on it. Right. And they learned this from Apple, who did not have the the cheapness anywhere in their model. No. It was about and a and I mean that with all due respect to Apple, it's it's a high quality experience. Um, I think that Google tried to have it somewhere in the middle, but still have it be highly affordable with a better resulting experience. You know, the, but the the I don't know anything about the Sony ecosystem that we're t that you were talking about. Well, Sony, Are you I, I think about gaming. What's that? Are you talking about gaming? Well, Sony as a whole, whether you realize this, and it sounds like you don't, is that they have. They have, they have themselves, if you were to look at the content offerings of Amazon, of Apple, of Google Play, Sony has a similar platform. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, they do. And it's, uh, it doesn't, the problem is that they don't have singular branding. And they still haven't tied in all the devices to consume the same content. In the sense that Sony offers a, a a uniform platform when it comes to gaming, music, videos, but uh, and when, if you want to go to a phone, then software. But th they also have a book store as well, which would be the final piece of the puzzle. But the funny thing is, is those four services I just mentioned. They all share content, but the book marketplace that Sony owns and operates is the one piece of the puzzle that doesn't cooperate with the rest. Well, it's funny because their book, their ebook product was the one of the first. Was one of the first, and and they lost market when the Nook came along, and yeah. then the uh, Kindle came along. I mean, the, it, it's really that's a difficult thing to recognize how close Sony was to being the the winner in that and they they lost every bit of it uh, well I mean the iPad before any uh, before any uh, it, but the iPad came after the Sony reader yeah oh yeah and if you remember I don't know if you remember this though Sony Sony had two runs at the e-reader before anybody there right. was an e-reader that they released probably like eight years ago yeah, I remember in college reading about it, and it, it was, was like only launched. In, it was like kum kum. Yeah, yeah, and it was only launched in Japan, and then there were plans to bring it to America, and it and they never f came to fruition. And then, like three years later, they gave it another go, and it released worldwide, but it didn't make any waves. And then we had, you know, the uh, the Kindle, the original Kindle came came to be into being, and sold like gangbusters. So I, I wonder if it has something to do with the fact that um, the thing that Google and Amazon and Apple all have is good relationships with multiple media creators, right? So Apple started that path and then the others fell, you know, followed suit and Microsoft too. But the thing about Google, Apple, Microsoft and Amazon is that they are not making movies. Whereas Sony has a lot of media that competes with a lot of the other uh, places, right? And I think I think you've touched up upon the issue because Sony's attitude has kind of always been: we own so much content in terms of the music sphere and the movie sphere that they almost don't care about any other content offering, and they're just like, whatever, 
you want Sony, you want Sony owned media, you got to come to us. And I think that was their attitude for a long period of time. And they're just now starting to slowly change that stance, but they're, they're too late. Yeah. But doesn't Sony media show up on my Netflix device, for example, my Roku? Uh, it does now, but there was a period of time where it didn't, you know, yeah. you weren't able to rent it, you know, or you could only purchase it. I think they ought to stick to media creation because that's what they're really good at and, you know, keep making speakers or whatever. But right. Well, Sony, I mean, they're not really relevant to this conversation. You know, I think the only relevance that they have is that they they had an end-to-end -end or they have an end-to-end -end, uh, platform, but nobody, I mean, nobody uses it. I mean, it's, it's like we talked about, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Google Play. Uh, and the question I wanted to ask you before and you know, I know you're a huge proponent of, of of Google Play, and I think this is a unique question: is that why was Amazon more successful with? I mean, they have their own version of Android, right? It's Android. It's basically. it's not a version; it is Android. Right. Yeah. Why was Amazon, or why is Amazon, more successful at offering their end-to-end -end experience? And why has Google been so slow to catch on, whereas Amazon caught on right away? Because Google Play and the Google Android market before it, because when they migrated to Play, they got into the business. Google Play was a late comer, very late comer. They're like the surface in the tablet market. Sure. So, uh, comparatively speaking, if you do a snapshot right now and say how many surfaces have been sold, how many Nexus 7 tablets have been sold, how many iPads have been sold, you're going to get wildly different numbers. And if you were to assess Microsoft's success in the tablet market right now, you would say they, they have no success at all. They, they, don't, they didn't sell one tablet. Right. Because right? nobody has a surface in their hands yet. Yes. That's right. Tomorrow that'll be different. Tomorrow that'll be different. And then, you know, numbers will change and over time we'll see whether or not uh, it's a success. But early on it's going to be very hard to compare numbers. You, you can do comparative numbers over history, but you can't do it yet. So uh, the reason that Amazon has been so much more successful than Google Play, if you do a snapshot today, is because people have been buying electronic media from Amazon for years, years and years and years. The Play Store showed up last year. And um, if I was a dedicated Amazon customer, I, I am an Amazon customer, but um, I don't make purchases from Amazon, electronic media purchases from Amazon anymore. I make them all on the Play, uh, on the Play market because I'm not going to invest in, a, in an experience that could be taken away from me in a, in a move against Google. Right. Um, you know, I always have the browser, but with play, it means I can view content on the browser, view content on my tablet, view content on whatever. Plus, the Google Play Store and the um, Amazon market, for the most part, allows me to get at my content regardless of of platform, regardless of digit of uh, hardware platform. If I have my Nexus tablet, I can get to my Amazon books, my eBooks, because I have the Kindle reader. I can get to my Nook books because I have the Nook reader. I can get to uh, content that I buy from the Google Play bookstore because it's Google. And the same is true for other platforms. The Amazon can probably get to, um, well, no, the, um, the, the Kindle probably has trouble going to other markets and making use of that content. Amazon, the Kindle, part of the reason you don't know it's an Android device is because none of the Google apps are present, <laughs> you know? So that's true, yeah. The, that's the thing. If it, it only goes one way, and that's part of the reason why I like openness, because I can get to more content on my single open-minded device than, you know, like I've made a few purchases on the iTunes Music Store, but I'm willing to walk away from those because... I, I haven't made such an investment that it, it's it, it's uh, soul crushing to lose all that content. Right. But I cannot get to my iTunes 
purchases from my Nexus 7 device, not because Google doesn't want it there, but because there's not an agreement with Apple. Right. Going the other way, though, um, Amazon Books, for example, the, the Kindle Reader is available certainly on the Kindle, uh, definitely on the Nexus 7, and I'm pretty sure you can get to it on an iPad. I don't yeah, but you cannot, you cannot, and the big difference between iOS and every other platform that the Kindle uh, app is available on, iOS, you cannot directly purchase a book through the app. Oh, really? Yeah, Apple made that change, I believe, a year to 18 months ago, where they made a, a policy change that said that if you were going to allow in-purchase, uh, in-app purchases, they had to be done through the app through the iTunes store. In-app purchases could not be made against any other marketplace. Well, I think that that might actually be true for Amazon too because in the few cases where I bought media from Amazon from my Nexus device, it pushed me to the browser. Interesting. So it gives me this web-based interface. It, it might only be with... Uh, it might only be with the audio audible which is also owned by Amazon. Um, I think that's that's more to do with, you know, Audible is not fully owned by Amazon and they're kind of like it's a marketing partnership and I think that's more to do with it because if you have the Amazon MP3 app, you can purchase MP3 music through that app directly. That's if you correct. Have, if you have the Kindle app on Windows Phone, on, on, on Android, whatever, you can purchase books directly from that app. All right, I wasn't sure about that because I haven't done it recently, but I remembered that experience I had with Audible, and I thought that Audible was directly owned by Amazon. Uh, let's find that out. I've always assumed that they were. Um, That's not our new phrase. That's our new catchphrase for this for this podcast. Is I don't know. Let me look that up. On January thirty first, two thousand eight, Amazon dot com announced it would buy Audible for about three hundred million dollars. The yeah. deal closed in March 2008, and Audible is now a subsidiary of Amazon. So what it says that what that says to me is that Amazon has not figured a way of rolling in the Audible infrastructure into their own marketplace. That's what they that are, says to me. They are starting to do this though, and as a matter of fact, they are doing it to such a degree that when you purchase a book uh, through the Kindle Store, you get a, an opportunity for a, for a discounted price to also get the Audible book at the same I, time. I noticed this last week for the first time. And both the both the ebook and the Audible ebook synchronize using WhisperSync. Yeah, I saw that. I can read to page 22 in the ebook and then t and then jump to Audible and start listening at page 22 in the ebook listen to page 30 and then jump back in and continue. It's such an amazing, amazing, absolutely amazing. It is. I love that idea. Me too. I mean, would I ever use it? I don't know. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm not someone who listens to audible audio books that often, but the fact to know that like that I can do that, that's like absolutely incredible because I mean, not that this is the same example, but there have been a few times in my life where I was reading an ebook and I had a physical copy of the book. And I would sometimes, you know, the physical copy of the book would be at work, you know, or vice versa. Um, and I would want to kind of pick up where I left off, but the page numbers never matched up. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, cause you, yeah, cause your, your text size was maybe different or whatever. Right. And it's very rare that you actually get page numbers in an ebook, it's always the you know the place or whatever they call it, and this is kind of alleviating that problem for people that have ebooks and audio books, and that's absolutely incredible. And I think that's I'm surprised. First of all, maybe you can correct can rectify this for me. I saw virtually zero press about this. Like I would think that this would be over Gizmodo or The Verge, or, or many, Engadget, not I, one article have I seen about I this. I've heard about it on one of my favorite uh, podcast networks called uh, This Week in Tech, Twitter. Okay. Well, and, I mean, they talk about it because they, they actually use Amazon as a, um, not Amazon, but Audible as a, as a, uh, 
commercial as a you know a vendor a commercial vendor sponsor yeah sponsor thank you you're welcome <laughs> and uh, that that hurt for a minute but uh, in talking about the service one of the features that they brought up was this idea of whisper sync now working between Amazon ebooks and the audible books which I thought was such a brilliant I I listen to content all the time most of the time it's free content it's it's um, podcasts. And I, I think I've probably only listened to maybe three or four audiobooks in my life and only finished one and didn't like it very much. I didn't like the book. The, the fact that it was audio was beautiful. And um, I was very pleased with that experience. But most of the time I listen to up-to-date content. It's one of the ways, you know, as I drive to work and back or as I'm on my way to dinner or whatever, I love the opportunity to listen to a technology podcast and learn about all the things that we end up talking about. I think that, you know, I, I've never been a fan of the audiobook. And the only time that I've ever listened to one was, you know, there's a new trend right now in audiobooks that I've, I've learned about, and that's uh, authors of books creating a whole new experience for the audiobook. It's not just a dictation. You know, for example, like uh, the comedian Artie Lang for his audiobook, he read a few chapters but then brought in special guests from his life to read different chapters. Yeah. Uh, Gareth Delabate from the Howard Stern Show, for his audiobook, he put a bunch of different pieces of content that were only available through the audiobook to make it, you know, a whole different experience. Uh, and that's the only audiobook I've ever, I've actually listened to is the Gary Delabate one. And, you know, it was really awesome. I liked it, but it was because it was a dip, they offered a, un a specifically offered a unique experience. Um, and I think... You get right. that opportunity too because of the way that audio of audiobooks and ebooks are being made now. They're truly interactive experiences. I mean, more interactive than turning a page. And you know, there have been attempts on paper to do that kind of a thing. You know, it, I think about um, Microsurfs was did some interesting things with its right, did some interesting things with its pages and its layout in order to create a new experience on paper. But yeah, Douglas Copeland is huge. That's a huge belief of his. Not just Microsurfs, but if, uh, I don't know if you've read JPod, but JPod is they take it takes it to the extreme. It's yeah. all, like literally, there's one part of the book, forty pages of just the letter J, right, in like a giant font going across the page for forty pages and nothing else. I mean, right. absolutely incredible stuff going on in there. So I mean, but think about you know the iTunes uh, book creation tool, or the the. Uh, the Apple ebook creation tool. Right. I forget what the specific name of it, but I know you're familiar with it because you've worked on it, worked with it on a project, I believe. Yeah, I'm still working on that project. Yeah, so I mean, but the ability to add video to a book and the ability to have diagrams that you can spin in three dimensional space and the idea that, you know, that opens up possibilities that were not possible on paper or would be very, very difficult to do on paper. And it becomes more like a computer interactive experience, but it's still a book. You're still starting at page one and you're supposed to go through to page 50 or 200 or 500 or whatever the case might be. But right. all the while, you have the opportunity to pause, you know, think about textbooks and the way that an inset photo um, can give so much depth to a concept and then take it a little bit further and say, how about instead of a photo here, we have a video that explains uh, 30 seconds about what this concept is and why you should understand it and why you should understand it at this point in the book before you continue on because the further chapters rely on you understanding this concept. So like so many other examples, this is one example that um, points to how lucky we are to be in this time uh, from, a, from a media consumption standpoint. And I think that you're right, and I, there's some really amazing breakthroughs. I think this Whisper Sync one we've talked about is a prime example of that. And even to, uh, you know, the Apple Book, the new that new Apple eBook uh, tool that's allowing people to embed various forms of media in Apple eBooks are two absolutely groundbreaking developments in terms of content creation. The problem, though, and I think this is a downside of, you know, companies providing these locked end-to-end -end experiences is that these tools are not cross-platform. No, right no we, we've been talking about that. It's, it's difficult to get to all of the content in store A from device B. 
but the thing is, is that, you know, this, like I said, this project I'm working on, we're creating an ebook that's going to have, it's, you know, based upon these two musical plays, you know, video clips of the performance, audio clips with in-depth textual analysis, photo galleries, the whole nine are going to be in this ebook. And we initially wanted to make it available on as many platforms as possible. And, you know, we were under the assumption that this new ebook standard that was adopted by electronic publishers would allow us to do it. But we came to find out that that wasn't the case and that only Apple, the, the Apple ebook platform was what the only platform that was offering the, the capability to do that. So our idea was Apple has the largest, uh, you know, amount of devices in the market Let's develop it there first, and hopefully by the time we're done, someone else will have a, a similar... A good conversion tool. Yeah, right, to get it on you know Android, uh, Windows, whatever. Um, and like I said, I think, I think it's awesome that these innovations exist, but it's, it's a big bummer when you want to try and bring one of those innovations or content that takes advantage of those innovations to another platform. And this all points to openness. I mean, my my personal keyword certainly, and, and this is why, because I feel like um, I understand that you as a company want to be able to protect your content, but at some point, you know, it has to be available for other people to to partake in. Because forcing somebody to use your device when they don't really want to is not good business. And you know what? It's funny. I, I really appreciate the way that you just broke that down right there with that statement because it got me thinking about something. There's been two industries that have already gone through these growing pains. If you take a look at uh, digital music sales uh, eight years ago and uh, online software sales, what was the common trend with all of them? Heavy, restrictive DRM use, correct? Right? Yep. And where are we at now in both of those arenas? Open, open, open. Pretty much no DRM. I mean, there's uh, most of the gaming companies like Ubisoft uh, that required very restrictive DRM solutions for their games, for the PC, have given up on them. Right now, the only holdout are Activision and Electronic Arts because they're the two evil empires in the gaming world. But everyone else is like, hey, PC, very minimal, non-intrusive DRM, and sales of PC games are... Were, were they were talking about PC gaming market being gone, not existing anymore, because of platforms like Valve's Steam, uh, and you know Gamergate and a bunch of these other platforms that are not intrusive with their DRM solutions. PC sales, PC game sales are they're huge. They're through the roof again, uh, and companies are, and especially ind independent developers are making money hand over fists with no DRM on their software at all because customers are appreciating the openness and allowing them to use the content that they want in whatever way they want. And the same thing is going on with music. You know, Amazon was probably the, was the first to offer true DRM music and they, boom, their sales were through the roof because you could use that music on any device. So Sean, this, this brings up a, a, a personal heartbreak of mine. Mm -hmm which is uh, so often I will be dedicated to a company like Fitbit, right? I have right. my Fitbit on right now. Right. I love this device. But uh, they have a brand new product, and the, what is the great new uh, added, uh, added value of the new version of the product? Uh, improved uh, altitude sensing? No. It's that you can... Oh, yes. I forgot about that. Yeah. Well, I can forget about it because it doesn't work on Android. It only works on the iPhone. Jesus. And so, despite the fact that I really love this device and have a lot to thank this company for, to um, point this company as one of the main reasons why I'm able to, to know how I'm exercising, I have to be a second-class citizen in their ecosystem because the one really great advantage about their new product, the idea that you can sync via Bluetooth on the phone mm -hmm. is not available to me because they did not develop the capabilities simultaneously between the two platforms. My phone has Bluetooth on it. My phone has the technology that the new device supports. The only thing that's missing is the application that they have to develop 
right. in order to make that available. Are you telling me that it is that difficult for this Bluetooth-based device and this Bluetooth-based device to speak? I don't think so. No, because Bluetooth is a standard. Bluetooth is a standard. That's one of the great benefits of it. Right. And you say that the Android uh, application will be coming, will be forthcoming. But why, what benefit do they possibly have other than catering to one audience and pissing on another one do they have to make me wait? There is no benefit. So why would they do that? Well, I mean, it could be an issue of money, resources. Um, if I was a company in that situation, I would provide my Android customers with a, with a timetable. And I'd say, we released the iOS app on November 1st. We promise to have uh, the Android app by February 1st of 2013. Something like that. But so that people are not feeling ignored. I feel ignored. And I feel like... Um the one distinction you made about your new product that that made any that had any interest for me over my current product meaning that I'm not going to give you a hundred more dollars is this thing on the phone the ability to walk around with my Fitbit and walk around with my phone and have everything be up to date right now it's a slight inconvenience to have to do that work manually and it would be very nice I would pay a hundred dollars in order to gain that benefit arbitrary changes by businesses that negatively affect our customers. Exactly right. Yes. Exactly right. Yes. But, it, but it happens to me all the time because uh, developers prefer iPhone. Developers prefer iPhone. And usually it's a monetary thing, but not in this case. They give away the app for free. Right. It, it really bothers me when I'm put in a situation where um, there is not a cross-platform solution. Cross-platform is my middle name. I want something to be available on my Linux box. I want it to be available on my Mac. I want it to be available on my Android. I want it to be available on my browser. I want it to be available on a Windows machine if I ever touch one again. You know? And uh, it bothers me whenever that is not the case. And there, there are many ways that they can make things cross-platform but they do have to walk away from proprietary solutions. Yeah, and I think that, like I said, this is a trend that's been repeated in the past with other sources of media, and I guarantee you that, that they will learn from the mistakes of other platforms. They will. I mean, it, you can't it, – it's, it's happened so many times. I mean, think about it. When you bought a game for PC in the 80s, maybe you, you can answer this, maybe you can't. Do you remember what the form of copy protection was back then when, when you bought a game on a floppy disk? I remember what the form of protection was for expensive software. Well, I'm asking about, they would do, like, for example, where in the USA is Carmen Sandiego? Do you remember that game? I do. After you would complete a certain amount of missions, it would say, please take out the special encyclopedia that came with your game and turn to page 96 and tell us the 13th word on the page. And the only way you could get that special encyclopedia was by buying the game. So it was a form of copy protection. And this, this type of copy protection had been in place through hundreds of different PC games in the 80s. Do you see that copy protection in place these days now? No. No, because they learned that customers would lose these books because they weren't crucial to the gameplay itself. They only serve one purpose in terms of copy protection, and it created these frustrating experiences for the customers, and, and, it got, and they dropped them. So this, this still happens today, though. I have key examples. So I, I brought up this idea of expensive software. What comes to mind is like Adobe, CAD software, or I don't think Adobe ever did it, but... Um, oh, I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. Yeah. So the way that you used to prove that you had paid for was that, was a dongle. And you would plug your dongle into your machine, sometimes through the PS2 port, sometimes through, after USB was around, through USB. Right. And it would essentially allow a circuit that would allow the software to run. And if you didn't have it present, the circuit wasn't there. And the circuit was broken, and it would say, where's your dongle? And so... You know, there was no easy way in software to emulate that 
although people sometimes did, because the dongles were secretive. You know, it, it wasn't clear what they were doing inside the dongle. It was it was an easy way, quote unquote, easy way, for them to give you a hoop to run through uh, when you wanted to run that software. So, what's interesting is this continues on today, even in in uh, password keys and uh, dongles. And what comes to mind is uh, smart technologies. The people who make smart boards go through some trouble to make sure that you can't run their software unless the hardware is present. And the hardware has very specific needs from the cable perspective. There is some question about whether or not you can run the software without the $60 cable that comes with uh, a smart board. But my question to you is, if you paid $40,000 to bring this smart board into your room, don't you think you could give away the notebook software for free to people who might be interested in your product? Yeah, man. Absolutely, man. It's it's that's that's so incidental, man. It's it really ridiculous. Is. Because you can't use that software without um without the board. So what's the point? Who cares? You could, though. I mean, theoretically... Yeah, to make the notes and such. I get it. A faculty member could work out their, their spreadsheet presentation at home and then come into the classroom where the smart board is present and run that on that machine and have an identical situation as they had at home, except they don't have the smart board at home because it's $40,000. Uh, or whatever the case, however expensive it is. The, the, a, an LCD version of it. But I just think it's really short-sighted to put so much emphasis on this field that you have to fill in with this, like, 30 key, 30 uh, character string. Right. And you're like, X, V, G, 8, 7, dash, 12. You know, it's, come on. Right. Yeah. Bob, you know what's funny, though? What? Thinking, you mentioning the smart board software got me thinking about another piece of software that was offered in the exact way you're wishing this was. I don't know if you remember this, but when Microsoft first released uh, XP Tablet Edition, one of the big pieces of software that they used to, to tout the, the new capabilities of, of tablet was OneNote. Yeah. That was the handwriting note-taking software. They used to f make that freely available. Yeah. On the Microsoft website, anybody could download it because their whole thing was, sure, you can download things and type into it and make notes by typing, but people want this software because of the handwriting capabilities, and the only way they're going to get that is by buying an XP tablet. And so they didn't care. Right. And so if Microsoft can do it, why can't smart technologies do it and other companies? I have no idea why Smart is doing it, other than they have a they have a proprietary mindset. They have a very proprietary mindset. I'm sure that if I sat down with the CEO of the company, he would explain very clearly and um, and sensibly why they do that and what experience they had that you know burned them so bad that they have to force customers to buy a sixty dollar cable and type in a thirty character string. But from a End user perspective, it is not a pleasant experience and causes a lot more frustration. And you know, there are alternatives to smart boards. There are alternatives to smart boards. For $10, I can get the Sari, run it on my iPad, have the server running on the machine in the classroom, and have a, an improved portable experience in which I take my iPad with me when I leave and have all of the benefits of that iPad from the time I leave the classroom to the time I come back. Smartboard doesn't offer that to me, so why are we going with Smartboard again? Good question. But like I said before about uh, about you know DRM, the gaming industry and the music industry learned you know they learned quickly that when you put those roadblocks in for your customers and you don't allow them to use the products that they've paid their money for in the ways that they intend to use them that you lose those customers. Yeah. And smart is going to realize that, and if they don't, they're going to be out of business. And that's, you heard it here first, people. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, smart has a, has a huge installed base, but there are some big competitors right now that are very low cost that 
offer some great advantages over the investment in a smart board. There's a tremendous amount of open source solutions that are available. We all know that famous Wiimote hack that we saw at a very early TED talk where a guy was able to create basically a smart board by hacking a Wiimote and putting that Wiimote on a uh, tripod and was able to do basically the same thing that a smart board does for the cost of a Wiimote, which is like 35 bucks, you know, so. A lot of ways to do it for sure. Absolutely. Well, I think uh, we've hit our, uh, we've gone overtime this week. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we had some injury time, as they say, in, in soccer. Um, another great episode, as usual. Hopefully our audience thinks so as well. Um, cut, tease a couple topics for the next couple of weeks. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, pro- I promise to watch uh, Zero Dreams of Sushi, and we're going to talk about yes. that next week. Fantastic. So to our, or to our audience, if you're a Netflix subscriber... It's available on Watch It Now. Watch it, and uh, hopefully you can join us for the conversation next week. I'm really looking forward to it. We'll have a virtual movie club. We will, but yeah. about customer service. But about customer service. As long as we don't, uh, don't, as long as you don't make me watch Empire Records, I promise. No, we can. no, 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 no. Uh, maybe we'll talk about virtual libraries. I don't know why that's there. Maybe, maybe we will. Maybe we won't. That's uh, <laughs> next week, and then further down the line. Our big discussion about Microsoft. Uh, I think it, I think it's time, you know, with the Surface and Windows 8 launching tomorrow, that's going to give me two weeks to uh, to to really dive in and pre- present some interesting topics in terms of Microsoft and what they're doing. Well, uh, I would, I'm probably going to get my hands on one too because we, of course, try to get one of everything at the ETC. So I, I will hopefully have a lot to say at that time about that product. Please do. I'm really looking forward to that conversation because I feel like there's a lot of misinformation being spread. Uh, there's a lot of unjust negative coverage going on in the media right now. And I think that, uh, you know, it's damaging the customer perception of a product that isn't even released. So uh, I'm, hopefully we can set the record straight and, and also talk about the pros and cons of Microsoft's new uh, strategy and how it impacts their customers. I agree. Sean, thank you so much. Great show tonight. Thank you very much, John. I'll talk to you soon. I'll talk to you.